never been more proud of any guest I've had in the 27 years of this television program than I am to welcome as my guest this morning the man that will be remembered as the single most spiritual impacting force of the 20th century. His name is Billy Graham. And I, I first met Billy Graham nearly 50 years ago. I was a student at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, a Christian college. And we invited a young minister who was about 27 years old to come from his little church in Chicago and preach to us for three days. And his name was Billy Graham. And he did something that I'd never heard before in my life. I grew up in a mainline Protestant church called the Reformed Church in America. And we never had what the Baptists had, that's altar calls at the end of a service. So it was a new experience for me. And the rest of my life, I want to lead people to a personal commitment to accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord, their Savior, their best friend. And I learned that from experience. Billy, that was 50 years ago. My, well, I'm honored to have been the spokesman for the Lord on that moment. And uh, Bob, God has honored and used you in the most remarkable way to reach people that none of us could ever reach. And we thank God for you. Well, Billy, uh, I remember being with you with the Lausanne Congress. Yes. And then the Congress of Evangelism in Patia. Right. And again in Amsterdam. Yes. And your face and voice is familiar to people in the cathedral. You've been here before. But today I am having you because I want all of the people who watch The Hour of Power to go to their bookstore and buy the book. It's called Just As I Am, The Autobiography of Billy Graham. I have it. I've read most of it. And it is a phenomenal story. If you don't believe in God, read the book of Billy Graham and you can't explain that kind of a life and a ministry without a sovereign God that was working in your life all those years. But tell me, when did you first make a commitment that would lead you into this life's work of evangelism? Well, it was in, in 1934, an evangelist came in our hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I didn't have much to do with evangelists because we went to an associate reformed Presbyterian church and uh, they didn't uh, have an emphasis on evangelism. But uh, he stayed for about, um, oh, four or five weeks. And finally, one of the men that worked for my father asked me to go. And I went and I saw him open the Bible and preach right out of the Bible. And that was a new experience for me. And uh, I went back night after night. And one night when he gave the call to come and commit your life to Christ, I went. And I stood there and received Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I went home that night and knelt down beside the bed on the little dairy farm that my father had. And uh, I knew that something had happened. I couldn't explain it. I, I couldn't put it in theological language. But I knew that God had done something in my heart. And that was the beginning. Billy, I know the answer to the next question. But a lot of people don't. So I'm going to ask it. All right. In all of your travels, in all of your encounters, all of the challenges you've faced on how can you believe in Jesus Christ? How do you know he wasn't a myth? And uh, do you believe in miracles? And how can you believe in miracles? How have you handled all of the intelligent questions that sincere doubters have thrown at you and at me and we who try to promote the faith? How do, how do you keep your faith? Well, you know, faith is an extremely important word. And uh, there are many different definitions of faith. But I think that uh, one of the things that I remember uh, when I went to Bible school, there was an illustration that someone told that I remembered about the little boy that was out flying his kite. And he'd gotten the kite out of sight into a cloud. And someone came by and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm flying a kite. Well, they said, we can't see it. He said, but I can feel the tug on the string. I know it's up there. And I feel the tug in my heart. And so I've gone by faith, believing that God has done things and 
is doing things that I cannot explain. There are many things in the Bible I don't understand. We were talking about that with our friends this morning. There are things that I do not understand in the Scriptures, and there are many questions I'd like to ask the Lord when I first see Him. And, uh, uh, for example, a lot about evil in the world and why God uh, created Lucifer and why did uh, he fall and why did he become the great Satan uh, that, uh, with all of the demons that we see in the world today. And the, and the human heart has remained the same through these centuries. And, and in, the middle, in the middle of all that, we read that God loves us and God sent his son to die for us and take our sins and he became sin for us. To me, that's a tremendous thing. And love is, so, is the key to it all. God loves us. Tell me, what do you think is the future of Christianity? Well, Christianity and being a true believer, you know, I think there's the, the, the body of Christ, which comes from all the Christian groups around the world, or outside the Christian groups. I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping uh, revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. I think James answered that, the Apostle James, in the first council in Jerusalem when he said that God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is doing mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. He's calling people for, out of the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world, uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. Uh, what I hear you saying is that it's possible for Jesus Christ to come into a human heart and soul and life even if they've been born in darkness and have never had an exposure to the Bible. Is that a correct interpretation of what you're saying? Yes, it is, because I believe that. I've met people uh, in various parts of the world in tribal situations uh, that they had never seen a Bible or heard about a Bible and never heard of Jesus, but they believed in their heart that there was a God and that uh, and they tried to live a life uh, that was quite apart from the surrounding community in which they lived. This is fantastic. And I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There is a wideness in God's mercy. There is. There definitely is. Tell me, uh, do you remember how this television program called The Hour of Power got started? Oh, I remember a few things about it. I remember when I was holding a meeting in Anaheim and you came over uh, night after night and would just sit in the little trailer that I had there as an office and we would talk and pray and you had a great burden uh, to reach people for Christ uh, all over the world. And you said, Bob, you should think about televising your church service. Yes. And I said, but it'd be too expensive. And I think it was either you or Fred Dinert who said, why don't you let God make that decision? Why don't you tr take it to God the way you, Billy, took your hour of decision to him in prayer in Portland, Oregon? That's right. Remember that? I do indeed. You put a fleece out. That's and, right. And so you and your folks prayed and we prayed that God would show us without any PR uh, financial support to start this hour of power. I remember that very well. And it was out of that that this was born. And I think it was you or Fred Dinard who said, well, Billy's an evangelist calling people to make decisions, and sure, you're a full-time pastor, call yours the Hour of Power. That Hour <laughs> of Power title came from you and Fred Dinard, didn't come from me. Oh my, and, well, I'm honored. Well, you're not honored, you were used, as we <laughs> all are used. But today it's still reaching people and the, the thought that you're with us today is, is just wonderful. How is your health? 
My health is fairly good. I've spent last week at the Mayo Clinic, and I go up there about every three months now, and I have to be checked for two or three problems that uh, could be serious if uh, we didn't watch them very carefully. You know, I'm getting to be an older person, and uh, these things pop up when you get a little past 70 or 75, and I'm 78 now, and I'm looking forward to the day when the Lord will say, time is finished here, come on up uh, to heaven. Billy, uh, a lot has happened since we met 50 years ago, and I was just a student studying for the ministry. Uh, mainline Protestant denominations, and I belong to the Reformed Church, which is one of these mainline denominations, are losing members, and uh, the decline is serious. You want to comment on this? Why are Protestant denominations losing membership? And well, I think the same is true in the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. And uh, I think that uh, part of it is, of course, is the tremendous competition we have from the world in which uh, there is so much uh, uh, to attract uh, young people especially. And uh, the second thing I think is that we are not proclaiming the gospel as we should. I think that people are hungry today for the Bible. And uh, I, I know churches that, uh, my, in fact, my grandson is the assistant minister of a church that started about 10 years ago, and they average about eight to 10,000 people on Sunday. They live close to a beach, and they allow them to come dressed any way they want to. And I've been there and sat in the back, and they didn't even know I was there. And I saw these young people opening their Bibles. They were all marked up, and uh, the minister didn't do anything except just start from the Bible. He, he had very little humor. He just told them what those verses meant. And there seemed to be a hunger on the part of those young people. And there are churches like that all over the country that are unknown, small ones, large ones. And I believe that God is at work in an unusual way today, in a, maybe a quieter way. And perhaps it's not the big crowds that I have or we have. It Maybe God is, is working in a way that He used to work in the smaller groups. Billy, if uh, you look into the future, what uh, challenges would you throw out to Christians? Join us next week as we conclude this special interview with Dr. Billy Graham. <laughs>